We acknowledge the Wurundjeri Boyrum people as the first peoples of this land. They have walked on, cared for, sang with this land. We are grateful that we can share their footprints as we acknowledge them. We commit ourselves to reconciliation with them as neighbours and friends. We recognise the deep and ongoing pain of colonial Australia and that the way forward together will require patience, grace and a deep ongoing commitment. Come and let us worship the Lord with joy and persistence as we seek the heart of God in others. Come before the Lord with love and reverence as we become the heart of God for others. Come, let us worship the Lord with praise and thanksgiving. Let us pray. Loving God, we come before you now in prayer and we give thanks to you for leading us to this place, for being there for us through all times, both joyful and challenging. We give thanks to you for making us your beloved children, your people of grace. We will walk your ways, O Lord. Jesus Christ, our Lord, you are always beside us, our companion on the way. You make known to us the mystery of God's will, and we trust in you to reveal in the fullness of time God's plan for us. It is by faith we follow you as pilgrims on the way, putting our hope in you. We will walk your ways, O Lord, Holy Spirit, disturber and guide, midwife and comforter, lead us on. Pour God's love into our hearts and help us choose life and to love. And give us grace and strength for the journey. Holy Spirit, help us come before God with all that troubles our heart. Lord, we come before you asking for forgiveness. If we haven't loved you with our whole heart and our neighbour as ourself, if we have hurt another or misused our power in any way, we ask you to forgive us and transform our hearts. We ask you for a fresh start and a new beginning. We ask you to change us and make us whole. So now, Lord, we come before you in a moment of silence with all that's on our hearts. Hear then the words of grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Your sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
from Mark chapter 6, verses 14 to 29. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you, even half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? She replied, the head of John the baptizer. Immediately, she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for his guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in prison and bought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. When the girl, then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Good morning, church. Uh, I am in sunny Bolwara uh, in my auntie's garden here. You can see behind me, there's only a few acres of it. Uh, if you see the kids either ride past on bikes or horses or you see some cows wander across the back, the reason that for that is because uh, on school holidays and the kids are running amok doing kid things. But I'll try to concentrate so I can bring you uh, some provocative theology for this morning. Um, and don't just stop with this. Please do some reading, ask some questions, have discussions uh, and debate about what this means. In, in the true tradition of Jesus, we are supposed to debate our understandings and theology. I find, I find this story of uh, John the Baptist being beheaded, I find it a really interesting story. Um, and it's hard to actually find a, a sense of truth and uh, happiness and joy and good news within it. But uh, I'd like to bring a few thoughts anyway to see where we go. Our opening frame of Mark gives us an image of John the baptizer. He is a bit of a wild man. He's out in the wilderness, he's eating locusts, but essentially he is of, um, he's of the priestly class, but he's not within the synagogue structure or the temple structure. He is a wild radical man who deeply believes that Torah calls them to be something that is not represented either by the temple, uh, by Rome or by the synagogue system. 
he is calling people to repent. Repentance is not about um, what we do now as we talk about, you know, ask for forgiveness of sin so you can go to heaven. Repentance in the Jewish understanding is admit your shortcomings, admit that you haven't fulfilled the commandments of God and the covenantal relationship of God and readdress your life to be all that God has called you to be, uh, not just as an individual, but as a whole community of people. And so John is this radical, radical sitting outside of the church. And Jesus goes and is baptised by him at the start of Mark. Now, Jesus, according to Mishnah, was following the pathways of becoming a rabbi himself, including uh, graduating at the age of 30 uh, to take on disciples of his own. Now, his graduation of that means that John was not just his cousin or wasn't just a minister in the area. Jesus was deeply, deeply devoted to the teachings of John. And so this radical John, his ministry and his mission is carried on through Jesus and then expanded through Jesus into that of what the Christ is and beyond that again into what the church is. This is a big step and John is pivotal uh, and vital in, in what it is that we believe that we are on about today. Then we have the character. We have the character of Herod Antipas. This is not Herod the Great who was responsible for rebuilding temples and, uh, and castles and, and the massive building structure and, clear, and doing things like holding onto his power by killing his own sons. Um, that's Herod the Great. This is Herod Antipas. Now, I feel for Herod Antipas because he's kind of a leftover. All of the political, uh, intelligent, cunning brothers had been killed by Herod the Great because he worried that they were going to take his throne. And so we're left with Herod Antipas, kind of wasn't threatening enough, and yet here he is as the kind of local king of the Jews. Now he had a complex relationship, uh, not just with the Jewish people, but also with Rome. He tried to straddle between the two. Um, Herod Antipas's great-grandfather had become a Jew in order to take um, in order to take a ruling position within uh, within the Jewish community, and Herod had danced the line between being Jewish and being a puppet of Rome. He was politically nuanced, and now we have Herod Antipas, who is not necessarily good at being a Jew, and he's not necessarily good at being uh, a Roman. And then he goes and does this other crazy thing where he brothers he marries his brother's wife while his brother is still alive. So there's a divorce and it's messy uh, and it's against Torah. John the Baptist is talking to Herod Antipas and saying to him, you've done the wrong thing. You need to repent for marrying your brother's wife. Now, Herod Antipas married a lady named Herodias. Okay, so it's something about the names in there that's a bit weird. But Herod Antipas married Herodias. She was supposed to be married to his brother and things started to get a bit wrong. She maybe wanted to have some power, she maybe wanted a bit more control or a bit more popularity or something because she gets very angry at John and she wants to kill John. But Herod Antipas says, I'm not gonna kill John, I'm gonna arrest him because I don't wanna kill him because even though he's speaking truth to me, I still respect him and I still like him and I still wanna hear what he has to say. And that's how we end up in this position where uh, Herodi Herodias, the daughter of Herodias, um, asks for John the, head, John the Baptist's head on a platter. She wants him dead. And so the mother manipulates the child to get what she wants. And this, this tension that exists then between... So, so what, what should have happened at this point is that with John being killed, his ministry should be finished. But there is an issue. The Jews believe that if you are um, on the day of resurrection, God will resurrect the faithful and they will walk physically again um, into, the plate, into, uh, into their second, second life, if you will. Um, for Herod Antipas, he knows he's killed John, like we hear at the start of this. He knows he's killed John and now he's freaking out that John is essentially the new Elijah or he is being raised again because the messianic age has arrived and God's judgment is coming. And Antipas, Herod Antipas knows he's done the wrong thing. Herodias is scared of John the Baptist because he will undermine their political status and he will undermine their social status. 
And so Herodias is freaking out because she's worried that she's going to lose her social standing. And she's also putting that on her husband. What happens when politicians like Herod Antipas begin to believe that their status and their power is more powerful than the people they serve? Do we see that in today's society? And is there a lesson we can learn from this? Now consider the power of a highly respected leader in our community calling out corruption of the political elite. What happens? Think witness K at this point in our own country. There are a number of things that happen within this reading. Um, firstly, John the Baptist's death at the hands of Herod foreshadows the death of Jesus. They both speak truth to power. They both speak Torah truth to power. And Herod is both the representative of Israel and Rome. And this plays out as we watch the crucifixion of Jesus later on. There's also, within this, there's also a, a theological image of Adam and Eve again. Now, Eve is seen as the one who corrupts Adam uh, by inviting him to see himself as equal with God and partake of the fruit of the tree. Herodias and her daughter both carry this Eve image and they seduce Herod Antipas. Uh, they cause pain and suffering through this seduction. And by the way, I'm not saying that women are evil. I'm saying that the seductive figure is called the Eve figure. That doesn't mean that uh, every woman is evil or that every woman is, is into seduction. What I'm saying is that um, we are often seduced into seeing ourselves as godlike and we put ourselves in that same position of being removed from the garden and going against God. It's also really interesting to see Herodias uh, being a, using her daughter as a pawn to get her own way. And this seduction isn't just about one generation, it's about another generation. And its implications are far reaching. So what are our ponderings for this reading? Do we resonate with John? Are we those who continue to speak truth to power even after we have been victimised by that self idolising corruption? Do we resonate with Herod Antipas? How often do we find ourselves trapped between hearing truth and killing truth? How often does our need to save social face mean that we side with the seduction of political and personal ideology? Or idolatry? Do we resonate with Herodias, uh, the one who seduces and influences power from behind the scenes, even to the point of using our own children to manipulate for our own personal elevation? Do we resonate with Jesus, the one who lost his mentor, his spiritual anchor and teacher? And what work in this legacy needs to be carried on? How lonely must it have been for one who lost one in whose footsteps you set your life? Or are we not in this reading at all? As I said, it's very hard to find the good news within this reading. In order to see the good news though, we need to think about what came before this and what comes after it. In the reading before this, Jesus is healing and restoring people to life. And then he sends his disciples off uh, in twos, in pairs, to do the same. But to not take anything of social value with them, they are to throw themselves on the hospitality of those that they go to. And then as, as they do that, there's this, um, this vulnerability that goes with serving. And surely this cannot work in a place where people are into self-idolatry. Then we have this reading of John the Baptist being beheaded. The following reading is the disciples returning to Jesus in their pairs to talk about how many people they healed, how many people they saved, how much redemption and reconciliation happened in their ministry and what their hospitality they received was like. We have this amazing bracket. The ministry of John at the beginning of Mark leads to Jesus being baptised. Jesus is mentored by John. John is killed by Herod Antipas, but his ministry continues because Jesus carried it forward. Then Jesus' ministry, which is carried on from John, is on to the disciples, and on from the disciples spreads through the church to today. That salvation that is offered by God is still 
present and is still active in our world today. The salvation that God brings has moved and is moving beyond the limitations of human violence and fear. We see the violent murder of John the Baptist and still the salvation of God moves. Jesus was crucified and still the salvation of God moves. Today we face the death of Christendom and still salvation is moving. Even in the midst of violence to individuals, the community of God still walks with God into new ways of healing and teaching. Our roles, attitudes and connectedness to that salvation will continue far beyond our death. Amen. Take a deep breath. Hold it for a moment. And breathe out. Breathe slowly. As you breathe in, 
called to mind the times you needed something more over the last week. And as you breathe out, let go into God's care those things that weigh you down. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. God is with you. Calling you into a new life, a new beginning of love and hope. Remember, God calls, leads, and holds. Loving God, of all creation, we pray. We pray for the people of the world, bringing our joys and concerns to you, our God. For those with a voice, may they use it for the greater good. And for those with no voice, may they now be heard. For those with power, May they use it with love, justice and mercy. For those without power, may strength, honour and compassion be theirs. For those who are health care givers and those who keep us safe, may they be kept well and blessed in their care. For those who have lost their health, may they seek their Creator and know they are loved. For all of us in our sphere of influence, may our power be couched in love and grace, God's guidance and light. Together or apart, may our prayers be a sweet blessing on the world through Christ Jesus. Amen. I now invite you into a time of um, prayer with candle prayers where I will silently light a candle and each time I light the candle, you're welcome to pray for a loved one, for your own Lord needs you. and whatever is concerning you. Bless you Let us pray. Shine gently on you. The Lord be gracious unto you. Lift up his countenance on you and give.